Lastasan series. Finally, we are ready to begin. Thank you for your patience. But before we actually start with the introductions and the reading of the bio notes, I would like to acknowledge the presence of students from Gisad Valley National High School and, of course, BCNHS also. So. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Ms. Len Regpala, who will be the speaker for food tomorrow. So right there. Welcome, ma'am. And yes, I've also acknowledged Gisad Valley National <laughs> High School. <laughs> Those who I have not yet mentioned, give me time. I'll probably get your <laughs> affiliation somewhere. So we're ready to begin. Let me just introduce to you our panelists so uh, we get to know a little bit of their background before we start grilling them with questions about our own writing. So this is on creative writing, and first on my list is Ms. L.A. Piluden, who was born in Mount Data, Bauco. She finished a BA degree in language and literature from the University of the Philippines, Baguio, and has participated in writing workshops like the CCWW and the ANWW. She currently teaches literature and writing to high school students in St. Mary's School of Sagada, Mountain Province. Our second panelist, Mr. Ivan Emil A. Labaine, was born in Caloocan City and is now a Baguio-based writer, cultural worker, and copy editor. He is part of the art collective Pedantic Pedestrians. As a group, they have held a book launch without a book, released four folios online, a torture manual, an concept series, a psycho psychogeographic work on Magsaysay Road, Baguio, Ngayon ay buwan ng wika. This is a working zine, among others. Ivan's creative and critical works can be seen in academic journals, Daluyan, Katipunan, Entrada, Critica Cultura, Perspectives in the Arts and Humanities Asia, and the Cordillera Review, and in online platforms such as Cha and Transit. <laughs> Mr. Abby Wagen weaves his stories from long conversations drinking sessions, I think we can relate to that, a lifetime of reading and a nourished appetite for experience. A former educator, he served as board of director of Baguio School of Business and Technology for six years. He also taught college in the same institution and at St. Louis University. Now he is working on his thesis at UP Baguio, a process that has seen him transform from his other attempts to write freelance, become a landlord, ran for public office, audition for an acting role, operate a garage store and an online business selling books, and finally, to love and lose again. <laughs> his writings have appeared in some journals, but he mostly posts his stories along with the works of other friends in a blog that he manages. Ms. Dumay Solingay is a Kankanai writer. She is currently interested with narratives of contradictions the indigenous peoples participate in our contemporary world. She seeks these stories and relates them through fabric, fiber works, poetry, and performance. And may I please acknowledge her very fancy footwear? She looks like a ninja today. <laughs> And we have Professor, Professor Rachel Pitlongay. She is the current chair of the Department of Language, Literature, and the Arts. And she is a st short story writer. Her narratives are based on her personal experiences. And according to her students, she is a formalist. So she assesses texts <laughs> formally. She's a formalist. But her students also say that she incorporates her personal biases after doing this formalist <laughs> assessments. She doesn't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think it's a good thing. It's a balanced kind of thing. <laughs> and finally, today, we have our discussant. So that's a word that I've been introduced to, I think, since Saturday. I've never heard of the word before, but it has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Very old English. So our discussant for today is Mr. Alan Carino, who is a poet and educator who graduated in, in, in English literature from Oxford University. That's in the UK, if you've never heard of Oxford. 
He is the president of the Ubog Cordillera Writers Group and part of the Baguio Writers Group. In his work, he explores his relationship to Baguio and the Cordillera and concentrates on landscape, especially the changes of contemporary times. He has published in journals in the UK and in the Philippines and also incorporates the intersection of visual, and lit visual art and literature into his work. So ladies and gentlemen, those are your panelists for today. Mr. Alan Carino will take it from here. Uh, thank you. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, so I'll just say a few words of introduction. Um, the idea for this panel was born out of the thought that we uh, as a generation of writers, uh, we're writers in our early 30s and 20s, um, do not talk enough about the future. And in many ways, we do not talk enough to each other at all, at least about writing. Um, which is to say, we socialize, and we drink together, and we even teach together and run writing organizations with one another. But uh, in the midst of all that, uh, and with the daily pressures of our work and things, um, we don't always talk about what writing means to us, um, what, the vision, what our vision is for what we write, what we hope to write, and even what we hope our friends and colleagues will write. In many ways, the question of what writing means to us and our hopes and worries for the future are private matters uh, for the angst of the writing desk. Um, it should also be said that talking about the future, which is suggested by the title of this panel, at all requires talking about the past. It requires situating yourself and historicizing what has led to the current cultural moment. What is the historical baggage that comes with being a writer uh, or a Cordillera writer? And what is the material placement of being a writer in this society? Um, I think uh, this panel's not going to be very formal. I want it to be uh, really a round table discussion. Uh, so we'll just uh, talk with one another about things that we don't always talk about. And at the end, uh, we'll leave a significant portion so that you can also feed in because I'm positive that just as much as the people here, there are at least some people in the audience who are going to want to be writers or are going to be writers um, of Cordillera literature. So uh, I suspect that one reason we don't always talk about these things is that talking about them out loud can sometimes feel a bit embarrassing or make you vulnerable or might even seem presumptuous um, because we're all writers that are uh, just uh, early or early to mid-career writers. But the fact is that a vision of the future is a difficult thing to build, perhaps even impossible, if you don't air your ideas to other people. It's like keeping a bird in a cage without letting it fly. Or a better analogy might be it's like keeping a story or a poem in a notebook without ever letting another person read it. It's very hard to gain perspective or to build on it to write something more then, to develop it further. Um, I think we probably all know here how different and more effective it feels to rewrite something that you have written after letting it out in public rather than uh, just experiencing it on your desk. So my hope for this panel is that if we have privately been imagining stories for the future and about our present, uh, narratives for our own work and the work of our friends for the years to come, even if they're only rough drafts, then we share them a little bit now, rather than keeping them in closed books. Um, because then maybe, rather than being retrospective, something we can look back on, there's something that can inspire us for the future. Um, so, all together, I think, for the people here, uh, both those on the panel and, I think, a number of you in the audience, um, the presence or absence of our voice as writers in the decades to come 
is inevitably going to contribute to the landscape of this thing called Cordillera literature. And when I say inevitable, I mean um, if we write, then it will really define the voice of a generation for that writing. And if we don't write, then the absence uh, of that voice will also be felt. Uh, so that's really the framing of uh, what I want to discuss today. And the first thing I would like to do is just uh, for each of the panelists to introduce themselves, but although it was already mentioned in the introductions given, maybe say what it is you write, but also a little bit of um, what motivates you to write, like your own feeling about what it is you write and why you write it. Um, uh, could I ask uh, you first, Ivan? Well, we'll just go around. Uh, what sort of genre do you write? What sort okay. of media, that kind of thing? Um, hello, I'm Ivan. Um, I write mostly poetry. And, um, poet, I write poetry, criticism, and um, parang essays from time to time. Tap, um, tas dun sa on the question of um, parang why do you write? What's your attitude towards attitude towards writing? Parang um, I feel like um, parang it's the thing that I can do well, di ba? Parang it's it's the thing that um, medyo cheesy or something. Ano ba? Parang uh, it's something that makes ano parang ano ba? It, it's it's the thing that um parang song lyrics yung makes me feel alive pero parang di ba parang we have things na na we do na parang we are passionate about we want to do to do this that's parang feeling ko that's important to do to do something na parang you're really into that uh, thing that's you're not doing it parang primarily nga, parang you're doing it primarily because you you feel like you have to do it or you want to do it not just because parang kung on mang, mga external factors like you have to earn money or you your mother says so blah blah <laughs> um tapos um uh, ayun yun muna <laughs> so no that's enough thank you Ivan. um dumai um hi um i'm dumai i write poetry um and what's my motivation um I'm beginning to understand why some writers say that writing is like breathing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, parang um, ever since I joined the Cordillera Creative Writing Workshop in 2009, uh, I, I have friends who like inspired and motivated me to um, do, do it. So parang, you know, it's like I wake up in the morning, my routine is to read a poem and try to write something about it. But of course, that doesn't always happen every day. That's on an ideal day. So, parang, if, kung hindi yun nangyari sa, like, two days, three days, or even a week, I feel like I'm useless. <laughs> I get depressed or something like that. So, um, there's always to have that drill or something. And of course, I think in all the forms of art that I participate in, writing is, um, it offers the most sensitive and most critical um, um, ano ba? Yeah, I think it's, it can, uh, how to say, you can express are or you can you can grasp things uh, that are contradictory through writing as compared with other forms of aesthetics um and uh, you said you're a poet uh, could you uh, share a little bit what are some of the themes or subject matters you especially like to write about in your poetry uh i think um as i look back now that I yeah, as I look back more on transitions from um, from rural to urban because I grew up in the village or Jaili and then um, and I studied here and so I see contradictions I see uh, changes like rapid changes so mostly like that. Um, thank you, Dumai and Abby. 
Uh, good morning. So I want to say I have a genre form content, but I have to say I just I just write. <laughs> I just write. Recently, I've been trying to paint, and what kept me from painting was this preoccupation on what the size of the canvas, the medium, and if you let go of that, mas madali pala, madali pala magpaint na. I'm I'm trying. So I want to I wanted to say na I write short stories, poetry, but looking back and uh, being involved with this research, I don't know the form, I'm not sure of the form. I don't want to be worried about form. Of course, uh, people will charge me of losing focus, but I wanted that in the end, the work will speak for itself. Yung niche, may establish na siguro after. So just write, write, out of necessity, out of want. Thank you. Um, and LA? Hello, good morning. Well, I'm still preoccupied with form. So <laughs> um, I started out with poetry, but now I, I just write short stories. Um, uh, this transition from poetry to short stories was was mainly because after reading Sinai Hamada, my, my life was never the same. <laughs> um, uh, I think I'm more interested in, uh, at first I was interested in the pragmatic side of sh of the short story written in the Cordilleras because these are things that you, they are like little histories. They give voice to the voiceless. These are things that you do not uh, see in a wider history. So I think I was I was first attracted to that notion that uh, nga, they, they are like a form of alternative history. And um, right now, I con uh, as I continue to write uh, fiction i the more i question myself as to what i write about because unlike manang dumai she she transfer she talks about the transition from ili to the city but as for me i grew up here in the city but now i work in sagada so my transition is really from the city i went back to the ili and uh, that is uh, in terms of theme that is something that uh, i'm currently exploring in my writing and uh, not just in fiction, but also in essay. So yeah, I'm still preoccupied with form, pretty <laughs> much. Thank you, Ellie. And Russ. All right, good morning. Uh, I also started with poetry when I was in college, but I started writing because, primarily because I like reading. And I think for most of you guys now with uh, the internet, um, it actually, and, and fan fiction, for example, um, many of you write, because you don't read what you want to read, and thus you feel obligated to write it, right? just so you could put it out there. I felt the same way, um, particularly when I, I also shifted to short story form. Uh, of course, nowadays, because of work, um, as the previous sessions of Talastas and lecture series have shown uh, this week, for example, writing is a passion project. It doesn't really feed you. So mine is I'm an, um, I'm in an academic. I can't or I don't have the time or perhaps I lost uh, a bit of passion or energy for writing. But um, if I do find the time or make the time in that certain sense, uh, I'd of course like to continue my passion in writing um, stories that I haven't read. And most of those are stories of um, Cordillera contemporary experiences, going away from this romantic notion of uh, who I am as uh, a person living in Cordillera and uh, related uh, topics and themes. So that's all. Uh, thank you. And uh, as for me, I'm I'm mainly a poet, um, uh, and I used to be a very form obsessed poet, very formal poet. Um, but I think one of the things that I've been adjusting to, actually, um, living and working in the Cordillera, is to get away from that a little bit. So um, recently, I've done a lot more spoken word poetry because. Whenever poetry comes up here, people are really ask, well, will you get up and perform it? Will you read it? So, um, so I've tried to incorporate more spoken word poetry, uh, hopefully to be more understandable as well. 
And then, uh, just as a side project that I'll mention, I've also recently been interested in uh, starting to write some, uh, I think it's, they call it speculative fiction, right? Science fiction and fantasy stories. But uh, trying to imagine those stories centering something different than the stories of Tolkien or uh, the fantasies of uh, these big worlds, uh, world metropolises that you get in science fiction. Um, so those are also some things I've been writing recently. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think uh, the first question I'll, I'll ask then um, uh, is one of definitions. I said earlier that in order to talk about the future, you also have to historicize where you're coming from. Um, and I think that uh, all of the terminology in the title of this lecture, um, the future of Cordillera literature, um, could maybe be questioned as to what does it mean? Uh, who are you talking about or speaking for when you say that? Um, so, uh, because um, I think Ras was being a little bit humble in that she's also uh, recently written um, a study on the history of Cordillera literature. Uh, <laughs> so not to put you on the spot, but um, uh, just because you've really thought about this um, in a way that I think is good to hear, Ras, what do you think of uh, this term, Cordillera literature, what does it mean or is it useful as a term? Like um, I actually gave a number of talks on this ah. and um, it's, it's always a question until now it's the same question that I, I throw back to uh, the audience or to those who ask me the same question. So um, primarily, I think we start with what is Baguio writing, what is uh, and Cordillera writing. Um, do these, when we say Baguio writing or Cordillera writing, do we need to always have an Igorot character in um, right. in particular forms? Um, when Again, uh, also when we say Baguio or Cordillera writing, does it m does your story or your poem or even your essay need to be a, um, set in Baguio or about any place within Cordillera? Um, also, uh, when we say again Baguio or Cordillera writing, does the writer need to be an Igorot or um, from Cordillera in whichever way that means. These are, um, I think, my preoccupation when, when I did my study, and it's a preoccupation that I still ask. And many, um, many writers, I think, until now, ask. For example, Ivan is um, from, where are you from? From Manila, all right? Um, but Ivan is based in Cordillera. You can also see, for example, some of uh, Ivan's poetry about Magsaysay, right? Um, there are members of Baguio Writers Group, for example, um, Mam Padma, Padma Pani Perez, um, who grew up in Cordillera, right? But not necessarily uh, Igorot, in whichever way, once again, we choose to define that. Right? Um, do we say that their work is not Cordilleran or not Baguio writing? So um, another, of course, many of you perhaps, right, or uh, our college students, because Baguio is the center of education, right? But many of our students are writers. Uh, they, it's just a question of perhaps Publication, that's another issue in relation to Cordillera writing. Um, but perhaps their, um, the sentiment, because of their education, because of the setting that they are educated in, um, spending four years in Baguio or around Cordillera, perhaps these have influences on their writing, right? Do we say that they're not Cordillera writing, uh, writers, nevertheless, because um, they're from other places, right? 
Uh, so for me, um, I'd, I'd like to, these are important considerations, but I ask them because I'd like to remove such limitations, right? Cordillera writing, based on my study, uh, my own reading, is still a developing, um, is still a developing, I'm not sure if you'd call it genre um, or form of writing as a region-based writing. It's still developing, but I think it's important that we open up um, the categories, right? And we allow the product, uh, the works, speak for themselves, right? I don't think that we can really come up with a definite um, definition, and I think that's a good thing. Because um, as I have found out, or I, I think I developed this idea that when we do come up with a clear definition of something, that means that that thing being defined has died, right? Because we can now set limits to it. So um, I, I hope that answers your question. Adam. Yeah, I think uh, that's really, uh, it's a really a thoughtful response, I think. And um, uh, actually, I'll, I'll ask Ivan. Uh, you also, I think, had uh, some thoughts on uh, the idea of writing or Cordillera literature and where that term comes from. So, uh, um, salamat, Alan. Uh, I'd like to take off from Rachel. Parang I'd like that idea na parang we have provi provisional definitions. Parang I I would like to parang distinguish that from yung parang liberal sense na there are no definitions if um <laughs> parang oh nga, parang on the one hand that's good na we don't have a steady solid definition textbook definition pero parang we have to acknowledge na nga, parang, uh it's it's an ongoing uh process of um pero um there are extra literary factors that na parang we have to acknowledge and there are uh we have to acknowledge yung yung the factors that ano or the forces siguro that that shape the the acts of defining para halimbawa ngayon we are having this conversation it's one venue to define to talk about um to to to, to propel the ongoing uh, definition tapos di ba parang there are other factors pwedeng uh, institutional like a, cer um, a certain institution will say ah ganito it's cordillera lit is blah 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 di ba yung ano yung issue with the like the the igorots nga yung issue with the textbooks na ang mga igorot ay ganito ganyan tas and parang we have objections with that um so there are parang merong playing field na there are other uh, parang different people individuals groups institutions can participate in defining what is cordillera lit pero we have to inga, parang let's also um recognize now we are not just recipients of these definitions we can um participate in the act, act of defining uh, whether through uh, conversations like this or yung mismo yung mismo pagsusulat natin di ba parang someone um la uh, with a zine or a collection of poetry tapos um yung mismo act na pagsusulat yung pagko um is an act of contribution to the to the definition tapos uh, I'd like to raise two points lang dun sa, dun sa label, dun sa uh, cordillera, cordillera literature. Feeling ko at most, meron siyang, it's, it's a convenient term, parang it's, it's a name, parang Alan, Buman, or UP, <laughs> parang it's, it's, it's a category that is out there, tas nga, it's up for grabs, parang we, we, we contest, or we, we it, nga, continual definition. Yung, I'd like to to raise yung geopolitics yung, yung cordillera na term kasi parang I'd, uh, I did some Wikipedia research parang yung cordillera was uh, yung official term na cordillera was parang um, established during Cory Aquino's term so parang I think before I yung, parang uh, mountain province something so yung ofi yung official term na yung region na cordillera region was Parang ano yun, 30 years or more than 30 years, 31 years. So parang we can also look back um, dun, dun sa history noon. Tsaka, I, I believe, I suspect, parang yung ganong establishment ng Cordillera, Cordillera region, yung CAR, as a political body, I fr also fraught with 
um, running uh, uh, various issues. Um, tapos um, yung writing, parang um, we all know na feeling ko nga hindi lang sa Cordillera, parang the Philippines, uh, we always say na we have a rich oral tradition. <laughs> tapos like our like um, parang um, tapos yung writing, yung the technologies of writing were mainly brought by the the colonizers. Um, tapos, uh, uh, parang I, it's just a talking point. Parang I don't, I don't, I, 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 I or a productive tension, siguro. I, I, I'd like to locate a productive tension there. Now, on the one hand, it's a region rich in oral tradition. Tapos, um, merong writing na we welcome natin. That's good. That's a new form, new venue. Tapos, parang if I try to historic, parang I was trying to historicize. Kasi di ba parang in the national scene yung yung pagdating ng writing through Noli, Fili, the periodicals, ano yun, Solidaridad, and so on. Hindi ko alam sa Cordillera, parang classic, again, si, si, si Hamada. Um, pero nga di ba si Hamada parang um, he's not... This, this is not to fault his... But parang hindi siya... I, hindi, I'm not operating on the logic na parang ay... Ha, Hamadad, my Japanese blood, but uh, one, does he count as a Cordillera writer? Parang I do not operate dun sa ganung logic. Pero yun nga, parang feeling ko, so si, uh, maski nung panahon nila Hamada, or in the Philippine history in general, parang it's really, it's not pure, parang it, parang, uh, it, it wa, parang produkto siya ng maraming commingling cultures at histories, etc. Um, yun, balik dun sa printing, sa, sorry, dun sa Cordillera writing, yun yung una ko naisip, si La Hamada. Tapos, inisip ko sa periodic mga journalism, sa field of journalism, yung Midland, chinek ko, parang 70 years plus sila, so around, ayaw ko, parang World War period. Tapos, hindi ko alam, baka, parang yun, parang yung, yung something na pwede, we can problematize, um, parang when did, um, Ang hirap kasi ng mga tanong na when did Cordillera writing, ano yun, parang mga tanong ng origins, kailan nagsimula ang ganito, kailan nagsimula ang ganyan. Pero parang I think, yun nga, as Alan said in his, ano, kanina, parang if if you are going to talk about the future, we we need, kasi connect, connected naman yung mga bagay. Parang we need to talk, we need to talk about the past or something. <laughs> talk about the past. No, I think that's really, uh, that's really true and I think one of, uh, Something that I'm really uh, glad that you mentioned is the idea that maybe it's a contested space. It's not a space that's resolved, right? And that Ras also uh, spoke about. Um, uh, and I think a lot of a lot of the things we'll be talking about today are to do with the various ways in which it's contested, right? Um, I think one thing that I'd add is that uh, for me. Uh, one of the most important things to think about, and especially for me, one of the most important things to think about in Cordillera literature is uh, writing it now, is that it should be contested. That really one of the things that needs to be fought for is for it to be multiple voices at once, rather than to try and say, this should be what the voice of Cordillet is. Um, that actually, uh, in many ways, I only feel that I can write being, uh, <laughs> well, you are giving different backgrounds to different people. Uh, in the, I myself am Iboloi, but grew up in the UK. And I think uh, in many ways, I only feel able to write if also Dumai is writing her story of uh, Ili to Baguio and LA is writing a story of Baguio to the Ili and uh, uh, all of you are writing uh, your takes. It's only in that kind of environment where I feel my voice can also coexist, right? Otherwise, it feels presumptuous or something. Um, following on from what uh, Ivan and uh, Ras uh, were talking about, uh, I think uh, an important part of the definitions of Cordelia May ah. I add something? Yeah, to please, you? please add. I, I'm, I'm trying to, I glimpse two choices there sa, sa usapan nila. 
is it one is to keep the to keep the definition fluid and the other one is to define it right mm. so i'm i'm trying to identify two pros and cons ng ganito <laughs> eh, to put it in detail mm. because when we go outside of this uh, hall or yes. teatro we will have to decide if we are going to define it or not or <laughs> we continue the conversation or the contestation but right. one of these days you will have to define your writing again if it's cordillera literature or not yes so how do we i'm i'm looking back at yung lecture ni sir del two years ago mm. sabi niya may problema sa pagdefine ng literature one of which would be yung geography if i'm not mistaken correct me if i'm wrong yes. geography it, hindi naman lahat na nandun sa cordillera na cordillera na map will really call themselves cordilleran or igurot <laughs> not all of them another one is yung history i think if i'm not mistaken nung sinabi nung in start yung mga i think it was americans who tried to canonize yung literature they took pieces of texts that were not necessarily literature and then called it literature mm -hmm. So parang contested yung term na yun. Yun ang isang con. Another one would be yung esen mai-essentialize yung pagiging igurot na anything na lang na lalabas na of being a cordilleran uh, it it will be seen as a cordilleran. <laughs> I'd like to put a kumakarelate kay doon sa recent na kasi nga produced by an or cordilleran. If you watched yung MMA fight last last ano, may lumaban si Kevin Bellingon tapos naka siya. May nag-post ng meme, sabi doon, only a cordilleran or an igurot can do this, sabi doon. <laughs> uh, kasi para nakarelax siya. Pero actually, if you're really watching it, or alam mo yung nangyari, this is actually a defense sa mount, or para hindi siya mamounta ng kalaban. Parang poor case sa igurot, poor case may sangay gutmut lang, because of she's also an igurot, inattach agad nila yung identity na ginawa niya, na hindi dapat, na actually it's quite normal. It's very normal at ginawang es essentialize naging ano, Another one would be yung may romanticize yung pagiging igurot. Especially I've seen this from when, I, I don't want to use the term outsiders, but those who are not Cordillerans and they, they want to write about Cordilleran culture, they fall into a trap of looking only at the good side or look or using the lenses of outside uh, Western, Western lenses, looking in. So nakikita mo na you actually are reading actually a socialist text, a feminist text, applied applied to a Cordilleran culture. Hmm. Parang paltan mo lang naman, eh, they, he started the story, ba, uh, in the Cordilleran landscape, uh, the mountains, the backdrop, tapos na, and then he started the story. You can actually change that to say, in the mountains of Midgard, or the mountains of, <laughs> of, the mountains of uh, another area, and then the story will apply. Si, si, ginawa lang niya na Cordilleran yung ano, because same, the same. And mabibigla sila eh, when they come here and then they find that there are other negative aspects of Cordilleran culture and sasabihin nila, that's not Cordilleran culture. Mm -hmm. uh, yun, yun yung one danger. Another, another one na con, I think, now, uh, for w the why we need to define it is that I have met a lot of writers, na ig na Cordillerans, and this I will be taking a less popular take if we have to, if we have to define, why don't we, siguro, ah, I, used, I said this two years ago, na if you are if you can say that you are cordilleran then okay fine your work is cordilleran mm -hmm. as simple as that why i've met a lot of cordillerans na they're not as empowered as they are when it comes to writing nakikita mo sa iba na may pride the, the, the igurot pride but when it comes to writing they're not as of course granted naman that all writers are proud of their writing na nahihiya kang ilabas <laughs> pero wala yung Yun. So maybe that's, uh, that's a need to define amidst all the problematics. Ng ano. yeah. Thank you. Just very short. Um, I agree that Cordillera literature is a convenient term, <laughs> but um, I, I feel that uh, I accept this term. Um, however, um, it's just that my I think I said this to Manang Dumay before. Um, Cordillera writers, I feel, uh, I feel, and you can react violently to it. Uh, <laughs> Cordillera writers, I feel, are not prolific enough, mm. or there are not enough yeah. Cordillera writers, or um, we are not diverse enough. Um, we keep, uh, there's still this uh, limiting, there's still something that limits. Yeah. I don't know if it's just uh, 
Anyway, but uh, I, I, I think that Cordillera writing is not prolific enough. And uh, sabi nga ni ma'am, uh, the work speaks for itself. I, if, uh, if we have a rich body of work, then it would be, it would be easier uh, to look at Cordillera literature in, in its fluid uh, mm. uh, definition. <laughs> and um, because Cordillera writing is not necessarily Igorot writing. Uh, you know, I think, uh, did that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> that did make sense, yeah. And I think um, I, it's a really good jumping off point for my next question, which is sort of to ask about uh, thinking beyond those limitations. Because actually I think maybe one of the subtexts of, of this panel is a little bit to do with exactly what L.A. was saying, that, um, yeah, maybe we are, are not prolific enough in some ways that... Um, that perhaps at least that is a critique that we know people have leveled at this thing called cordialit at times, right? Uh, even uh, asking, is there such a thing as cordialit after Sinai Hamada and that sort of question? So, so I think, uh, so I think, one of the purposes here is at least to open up our imaginations or to try and go beyond, you say maybe there's a shyness or a limitation still there, uh, to go a little bit beyond that. So one of the questions, and I think one of the core questions that I wanted to ask in this, um, in this panel, um, and I think everyone in the audience, you can expect, expect the writers to squirm a little bit at this question because it's a very uncomfortable question to be asked as a writer, but I'll try to make it more painless, is... Um, what what are some of the things that you dream of writing then? Uh, if you're imagining outside of the limitations that are placed on you now or the things that may inhibit you or the pressures that are on you, and instead I ask a question like, um, in 20 or 30 years' time, what would you like the landscape of, of literature around uh, in this place to be? Or even in 20, 30 years' time, if you were looking back, what would you at least feel some sense of uh, achievement at having, at having done? What are your aims and goals? Um, because the reason I ask it like that instead of just what are your hopes and dreams for the future is because maybe it's more concrete then. If I say, in 20 or 30 years' time, what would you have liked to have tried to have written? Uh, what would you like to have tried to have achieved? Um, can I ask you that, Dumai? Um, like, uh, what, what are your hopes for what Cordy Lit will be in decades to come? Um, of course, I dream to write books like any other writers. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh yeah this is in relation to the uh to the previous question because um i do spoken word i'm interested in oral oral poetry and uh yeah um um lately i've i've been i uh, know i've been trying to um look into how oral literature, not to romanticize it, but because um, someone, it struck me when someone, um, a Vietnamese friend told me while in a discussion, and I'm talking about oral literature, and he said that, wow, um, parang it's, it's very lucky for you to, na, na meron pa oral literature that's existing. It's like, it's resistance in itself. So, um, yeah, um, I'm trying to, well, <laughs> so anyway, um, how, how do we, how do we uh, use oral literature in an urban context or those who transitioned from Ely to the city, 
or how do we relate this oral literature to, um, I'm sorry to use the word, to those who are not familiar with Cordillera oral literature, like people from Manila or from a foreign country, how, how do we, um, how do we relate this? How do we perform this? And how do we develop this, not to tokenize oral literature, but to use it as, um, you know, as a form in itself, something like that, yeah. So, um, like, yeah, you were asking about the dream, and I feel like, um, like in 30 years or after 20 years, um, I like to have a community that does this. I like to see com not only one community, but communities of young people, of um, uh, people in the urban setting using it as, uh, um, yeah, as, as their means of uh, expression, yeah, and as their means of, um, as their aesthetic, as their aesthetic means, parang ganon. Yeah. And uh, and when you say that you're you're talking about particular uh, oral like forms, right? P particular traditional forms, like um, I you say uh, you'll see communities using it. Can you give an example of of uh, some of the work you've already done where you've incorporated these kinds of forms into performance and? Um, uh, didn't you do that recently? Uh, yeah, I, I, I tried to. I tried to do a workshop with a group of writers in. In Vietnam, um, about uh, doing uh, collaborative poetry, and I patterned it according to Renga. Uh, so, you guys know Renga, right? It's this Japanese tradition where uh, one poet would say something and then the last word would be the first word of the next poet. So it goes on in a round thing like that. So um, yeah, and I patterned it in, into that because Renga is popular, but it's very common in, in the Cordillera tradition. So, yeah, that's what I'm experimenting on at the moment. And I hope since you're from um, schools, uh, I'll be very glad to experiment it with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Dumai. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think, um, I think that uh, one thing that uh, emerges from what you said, this dream of, uh, in some way, I, I don't know, trying to square the circle or make the circle, right, of uh, of reincorporating or using uh, this oral tradition and that Ivan, Ivan also mentioned is partially a negotiation between, I don't know, the different, the different places that, uh, that, Cordillera literature sits, so as part of firstly incorporating these different uh, these different peoples from um, uh, from the mountains into Cordillet under this geographical uh, organization, like Abby said, and then that as part of national literature as well. Um, that you said uh, you think that one of the functions one of the functions of the Cordillera in a lot of literature is almost could be swapped out for the mountains of Middle Earth or the mountains of Midgard and things. Um, so uh, because I know that it's something that uh, you've at least thought about a little bit, uh, L.A. and Abby, but I'll ask L.A. first. Um, how do you try and think about these nested set of relationships because you're based in Sagada. How do you think of this nested set of relationships to the Cordi, first of all? Because you said maybe you accept that terminology, Cordi lit, and then that nested within 
this thing national literature or Philippine literature? Like, how do you think? Uh, I guess what I'm asking is, what do you think that the role of Cordy Lit is in national literature? And is there something you'd like to see change about that? Or uh, you think it's all working well? Or <laughs> okay, this is something that I have, uh, I have continued, uh, I'm attempting to write an essay about that subject actually, but it is something that even I uh, grapple with because, okay, um, can I read something yes, that please, uh, please. I recently posted on Facebook? All right. Uh, I said something to the effect of the Cordillera writer is expected to imagine the inviolable self. And I took this phrase from, I think it was uh, Casper, mm. uh, that the Filipino identity seems to have lost. They need the, the Cordillera writer to supply the primeval, the local coloring, the smoky rituals, the jawbones. They expect an adulterated tradition. They expect a way of life that has been mummified into preservation. The more ancestor-like, the better. <laughs> but the Cordillera is no monolith. It is no mummy, hollow and unchanging, and there is no inviolable self. <laughs> and uh, for a while, I felt good about having written that. But then um, uh, um, I also... I. Why is it that when a Filipino writer adds the local experience to his writing, it is called local coloring? But why is it that when the Cordillera writer, when he writes his experience, it is called exoticism? That's <laughs> another that, uh, that came out. And then um, um, one of my professors, Mom Ruth, uh, commented on my post and she said, um, self-exoticism may also be a strategy mm. among <laughs> again <laughs> among uh, among writers of this with this uh, unique historical experience mm. and um, uh, um okay ganito yon <laughs> igorotness cordilleraness whatever what have you oral literature many of these things are the es Essence, my <laughs> many of these things are rooted in the collective. Mm, yes. um, they are rooted in community. Um, they are rooted in the land, without which uh, there is no culture. I remember one of my students in Sagada wrote, um, without land, there is no culture to be built. Mm. It is the same with our narratives. Our narratives are closely related to the collective and it is closely related to the land. But what happens when the... Cordilleran, M maybe I'm speaking from the experience of an Igorot. Um, what happens when the Igorot uproots himself from this land which defined him and then goes to a place where he, is he or she is othered? Mm. So then um, I'm trying to explore that uh, the, the, this Igorotness is based on the collective, but when you are uprooted from the land, suddenly igorotness becomes individual. It <laughs> becomes subject. It becomes uh, subjective. And um, yung ako stream of consciousness na ata to kasi paano na punta yon sa national lit. Um, uh, sige. Anyway, anyway. Um, pwedeng reset, reset. <laughs> <laughs> kasi bigla ko na alala yung ano. Na, bigla ko na alala yung ma, yung Bicolano literature. Um, Christian Sendon Cordero. Um, I think the Bicolano literature and Ilocano literature really shows how regional literature can can uh, can be part of national literature. The thing with Ilocano writers and Bicolano writers is that prolific kasi sila. And here I go again mm. with that argument. They write a lot. They produce a lot. And there are so many writers empowered to write. Mm. That is why you can say that they have a place in national literature because they, they are acknowledged even by, by this Manila-centric mm. uh, <laughs> literary elite. And, uh, but Cordillera writing, yun nga, it's, it's still sporadic. It mm. is still in the community, unmined, unharvested. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I just go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, Ras. Um, I, I think to continue, to, uh, to continue LA's uh, discourse, 
uh, in relation to national uh, to national literature and how we see um, or me personally, how I s want to see Cordillera literature in the future. I do agree with LA that um, going back to what I have said a while ago, I don't think that we can come up with even just a clear term of what Cordillera literature is at the moment because we don't have enough um, production. right? <laughs> uh, so I think in relation, it, it is kind of production. Um, Right now, for example, uh, NDBD has this Buklatan event sa Museo nga. I do invite you after this. Maybe you'd like to go. There are books uh, for sale as well. Anyway, um, I, I saw, for example, LA students um, showing some of their zines. Right? So these are... Um, for for those who are not aware, these are independently produced, usually photocopied. That's why we have the term seroxography, right? Um, but that is one way of sharing works, right? Without necessarily going to publications or going to this very long process of production, right? Um, it it shortens the distance between the writer, uh, the writer's work, and uh, the audience. And I I my hope. And I think in relation to national literature is for Cordillera writing to produce greatly within 20 to 30 years. And one way of that is um, for more similar works, right? Not necessarily nationally published, but us producing our own works for our people or for, for audience that we want to reach, right? Um, to empower ourselves uh, to produce and to share these works. Okay. Um, I'd like to bring in one other aspect, I think, in relation to Cordillera um, writing. One, I think, is the importance of community. Right? Uh, we've been talking about collectives, for example, collaboration. Right. Yes, and I think this also needs to be strengthened. So um, I, I'd like to add that to my hopes <laughs> for Your the hopes. future. Uh, that's something that yeah. I'd like to see. And in relation to that, of course, you as students, you as writers, Everyone future in this writers, room. Um, to empower yourselves, to have the ability right, to create that community, to uh, contribute to that community, uh, to lead such communities. Yeah, I, I was thinking about uh, empowerment in relation to literature also recently. But um, first of all, I'd like to ask just to follow up because you're talking about uh, the importance of producing these forms of literature like zines and things. Ivan, I know that um, the pedantic pedestrians have been heavily involved in... Uh, um, uh, what is it? Uh, L B B T X, B -L -T -X. <laughs> <laughs> which is um, better living through xerography. better living through xerography, right? Um, can you talk a bit about your feelings about that kind of literary production and uh, why uh, why you use it? What's it what it means to you? Link. Um, I'll try to connect this to I know to. Uh, the the earlier discourse yeah. yung sa kala LA and Ras. Um, tapos niya they also mentioned it naman yung need for parang yung yeah, production. Um, tapos the the uh, yung yung independently produced na na or self self produced na works nga yeah. usually parang kung meron kang home printer you can print your own stuff. Um, or parang potluck system mag ano kayo pa photocopy pa bind yung sa maharlika or what. Um, Yun, parang nabagit ni, ni Raz, parang to, uh, parang, um, well, para maiwasan na yung uh, long process ng publication, tedious, you sometimes bureaucratic, tapos sometimes the favorite, uh, parang the connection system, parang, parang meron kang kakilala sa publishing press or yung director ng press friend mo. So parang more chances uh, for your manuscript to get published. <laughs> tapos, I wanted to say something about the ano yung so nga parang that's a venue for yung Cordillera lit to 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 um to for for the for the uh products to be ano distributed. Tapos I I wanted to engage yung ano yung kanina about uh yung thing about Cordillera lit. Kasi parang I'm coming from a different um 
position na minya parang wala akong cordillera route so to speak and I'm, I'm not using that in a in a ano yun, ossified tokenizing sense parang parang I'm from Manila tas tas gusto kong i, i, i I'd like to connect that to the yung yung mode kanina about transitions kunare di, parang different kinds of transitions si, si LA city to Ely si Dumay Ely to city tas si Raster was talking about something kanina korte, parang gusto niya ng contemporary experience in con, 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 contemporary cordillera life na yun nga hindi yung mga yung mga exoticized mode or images tapos i have my own transition na from manila tapos um bagyo bagyo writing tapos um yeah tapos I, I i gusto ko kasing i'd like to connect that to the larger setting eh. parang our personal transitions are brought about by something that is larger than us kunwari yung cordillera experience in the, and also this is in relation to national lit region and nation di ba yung cordillera um, it's part of parang it's part of the philippine the philippine nation pero it merong uneven experiences kunwari sa, sa, sa national history kunwari colonization um colonization is a kind of ano eh parang di ba yung yung motif ng transition globalization movement merong outsiders they went here to ano to colonize us pero yun nga uneven yung yung experience parang arguably yung cordillera and i think the moro yun din yung isa sa mga frustration ko parang sa aking sa aking knowledge on national history parang yung yung knowledge ko ng national history parang mostly yung Luzon centric Luzon parang lowland centric parang di ba mga pag-aalsa ganyan makabayang diwa parang parang i, I was thinking of it parang di ba sila Rizal Bonifacio they were from Tondo Laguna mostly the Tagalog Luzon areas tas siguro ang pinakamalapit na Ilocano sila Isabelo sila Luna tapos yung Cordy the 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 Cordy region they had parang had its own um parang may, may slightly different yung experience nila parang they were uh, less colonized um tapos so there parang nga, feeling ko dapat natin acknowledge yung unevenness ng nation um pero uh, unevenness ng nation pero nga, parang it's something na parang not to exclude ourselves parang nga, to participate in the 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 shaping of it tapos sorry and dapat gusto i-bring uh, i-bring in yung si Dumay she nung talk last time Dumay had the talk nung Cordillero Creative Writing Workshop tapos parang sinabi niya um i think ano eh, parang merong sinabi si Dumay na something like ay nationalism parang what what does it even mean parang parang i just I, i would i parang i'd prefer not to be a nationalist kasi minsan nga na um siguro pwedeng i-elucidate mommy ni Dumay parang i think she parang she was coming from this position na uh, as a uh, as someone from Cordy na parang they are excluded in the nation tapos i parang i wanted to to ano, to take that comment in good faith na hindi ko sasab- hindi ko inisip na hay ito na naman, uh, parang ano ba naman to si Dumay parang she's secluding herself or what parang i th- i'd like to think that she's coming from a um, critical doubt na parang di ba tama naman di, parang when we speak of the nation when we speak, when we speak of nationalism parang what nation are we fighting for mm-hmm. parang what is this nation na na we are um defending from the outsiders um, um w- we'll move on to the uh, yeah, you can finish your thought but i will just okay, um, finally yung ano um yung nga, yung, yung motif ng transition eh, uh, transition uh, parang adaptation not parang changes um it's something that we can yung nga, we can own we can dictate parang how will things change at paano parang yung nga, the directions of cordy writing uh, uh, cordy writing of lit in general tapos kunare i'd like to think of this as positive ano examples um yung yung di ba there's um i think yung term na cordy cordy lit is more productive than cordy writing kasi yung nga, parang yung writing na tas parang the yung region has this ano parang heavily oral tradition na um, um na maganda tapos para to to 
so we can go uh, we can move away from that binary writing chaka oral mm -hmm. i'd like to take up the the oral theme topic kasi parang i i share the concerns na minsan exoticized parang tokenistic in, in, exclu, uh, inclusion uy merong program sa CCP sa Manila o Cordy representatives <laughs> o parang you dance your dances or you recite your your recitations tas nga uh, hindi wala kasi akong Cordy experience na super grounded parang unlike sila sila Ras uh, everyone parang and i pero i get that point na parang yung lit yung Yung, oh, yung traditions, literary traditions, cultural traditions, they are grounded on experience, culture, land. Um, tapos, kaya, tas parang, ano, multiply removed ako dun sa, kunwari, nakakanood ako sa Malcolm Square, there's a program, tapos people will be do, the, doing the performances. Tapos parang mas ganun lang yung exposure ko sa ano parang syempre diba parang hindi naman siya hiwalay dun sa way of life ng mga tao eh parang di, um, pag nagugo pag nagugugol ako parang malalaman ko na may rituals for cer certain ceremonies ganyan and i am um, removed from those first hand saka community experience um yun lang sorry sorry no it's okay i no i mean i actually thank you for uh, that because i think it's it's an important it's an important perspective right that uh i think these varying feelings of inclusion and disinclusion uh but uh the only reason i was rushing you a little ivan is not <laughs> it's not for any reason other than i also wanted to include uh the audience right so i didn't want to uh cut short too much uh the possibility for you to ask uh questions so uh, first of all, I'd like to open it up to uh, the audience. If you have any questions or even your own thoughts about these questions we've been asking, um, this idea of uh, what literature will be rather than what li writing will be. Um, or even if some of you aspire to be writers yourselves or are already writers, um, and would like to weigh in or uh, or ask for a reaction from one of us. Anyone? Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Uh, there are three uh, ideas I got from here. Mm. And uh, there's one thing I'd like to point out about Cordillera literature. Cordillera literature to be empowered is to use the Cordillera languages. Yes. Okay. Empowerment of English and Filipino, it's already there. But the empowerment of Cordillera languages, we are still starting. We have hope in MTB MLE. We will <laughs> teach our children to write in their own languages. Teachers should help pupils you know, recite in their own language and then write, you know, mga maliliit tula in their own language. And this will become uh, instructional materials in MTB MLE. I will, uh, I would like to predict that Cor Cordillera literature, literature will flourish in the next five years after the graduates, the first graduates of MTB MLE will uh, uh, come out, <laughs> okay? Uh, so it starts there. Sab in communication, sabi, you know, the medium is the message, mm. okay? Uh, sino na yun? Makluhan. <laughs> okay, so if you want to talk to your own people, use their language. Mm. In education, in local governance, industry, tourism, use Exploit your language in whatever form. And then uh, second, so malaki ang role ng teachers dito. And teachers of the MTB MLE should uh, use their own language also. Do not teach a language that is not your own. Mm -hmm. And then uh, because we are multilingual, because we are multilingual, then we can translate all these works into English and Filipino and uh, have our own audiences, Filipino for the entire nation and uh, English for the international community. 
So there's, there's market for our indigenous literary works. So uh, Cordillera, uh, the, the concept Cordillera should not be limited to the political Cordillera, but to the family of Cordillera languages. Mm -hmm. This is linguistic. Kasi kung political, dito lang yung car. But actually, Cordillera is uh, North Old Northern Luzon. It includes the Itawes, Ibanag, Yogad. Those are Northern Cordillera family of languages. And then the Central Cordillera, and dito yung Ibaloy to Ifugao to Kalinga. Uh, uh, yan, yung Cordillera family of languages, Southern, Central, Northern. And of course, Ilocano is also uh, I within the Cordillera family. And uh, also for those who do not speak your language, your mother tongue anymore, relearn your language. Mm. That's how I did it. I had to relearn my Ilocano. I used to write in English and Filipino, but now when I conduct lectures in the Ilocos, I use Ilocano. And I talk to them in Ilocano, and we do discourse analysis in Ilocano, in Ilocano. exciting. I want to uh, thank you so much for uh, mentioning the importance of of language and the Kodi languages. It was on our it was on our list of questions, but we didn't get to it. So, um, uh, could I ask? Uh, I think La, you said you said maybe you had something to say about um, your experiences because you're a teacher with the idea of um, MTB MLE. So. Uh, Um, I'm not exactly a teacher under MTB MLE, but um, I do try my best to empower my students to write, speak, and therefore think in Kankanae, um, which is why when they write their poetry and their curriculum in creative writing is in English, I, I tell them specifically that uh, they can write in their own native language, etc. As for me personally, I write in English. I am not fluent in Kankanai. I can only speak it at a functional level, and which is why I'm in Sagada, in order to learn the language, in order for me to write in the language, but that is my own personal burden. Um, but uh, you have students here fluent in the language. They can see metaphors that you do not see when you're thinking in English. They can look at comparisons between a dripping moon and the spilling of rice grains. Something you do not see in the English language, but you see it in their language. And um, that is why I'm excited to work with young people, especially the young people there in Sagada, because they have such a heightened uh, awareness and consciousness of uh, who they are uh, ethnically. And um, they know how to use their language. And um, I invite everyone to go look at their zines. Don't sell my lobby. They're selling their zines right now. That, that <laughs> <laughs> the name of their, uh, it's a collection of their poetry. It's called Gagagai and uh, Kudse, which means strength, but at the same time, mischief. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I specifically put uh, Kaiser Ivan. Uh, I'm from Manila, and I studied here ano, as a comm student. So, um, so, yung whole concept of Cordillerian writing is really, ano, an, hindi siya ma encapsulate into one definition. So, yung problem ko is, ano, although I want to contribute, uh, parang, um, there's this danger of exoticizing the culture that I did not grow up in. I did not grow up in. So, um, what are your um, comments on that? Or in other. Salamat, madam. Anya, anya, ano pangalan mo? Hana po. Hana. <coughs> o nga, um, salamat sa tanong na yun. Um, yun nga, parang, the way I, ident parang I, the way I identify myself, parang bilang, parang Baguio-based writer, parang mas ganun geographically na, eh, flat, parang wala akong gaanong, parang, fuck. Yung Cordy, yung Cordy writing, I think parang hindi pero yung tanong mo kasi about exoticization, exoticization no. Feeling ko ang pinakamahalaga ay you know what you're talking about parang kunare 
gangsa or something, certain ritual, ilalagay mo sa kwento mo or sa tula mo. Parang hindi mo lang siya nilalagay bilang isang term or isang language. Tapos lalagyan mo ng footnote. Number one, gangsa is a blah blah, you sinifugaw, something. Parang you have a deeper understanding of the, of the, the object, kung yung context niya saan ginagamit ang gangsa, etc. Tapos, ano eh, parang it will also benefit you. It can enrich your your deployment of the term eh. Kunwari, um, kunwari gangsa, hindi ko masyadong alam yung gangsa. Parang kunwari gangsa, tapos kunwari sa certain culture, meron pala siyang ibig sabihin na the death will come back or something. Tapos pwede mo siyang paglaruan, ganyan. So, ang mahalaga ay, uh, parang sinasabi uh, ni nung last na, last na Cordy writing workshop, tapos, Si Mam Luchi, parang she was she was saying something about the every parang ano the other panelists also parang something about immersion, parang dun mo naman magigain yung knowledge yung yung deeper yung understanding mo dun sa dun sa context ng mga bagay. Inga when you get to know how uh, parang paano siya ginagamit at sa sa context. Although feeling ko ano parang hindi parang na ako conscious ako sa mga tingin ng mga friends ko dito. Pero feeling ko parang you ha somewhere kailangan mong i-acknowledge na if you can do it reflexively na parang oy, yung deployment ko ng gangsa in this work, in this story, in this essay ay based lang sa aking um, five day experience doon, something parang I was not really born uh, with this culture, etc. I just learned it along the way, something something. Um, yes, I, I I was going to ask one one of the one um, I I just like I I think there's a fear um, even among Cordillera or young Igorot writers, halimbawa, there's a fear about writing the uh, about the culture because we have to admit Cordillera culture is very very rich. It's um, alive uh, for for those who are from uh, the provinces, Halimbawa, we still practice our cultures, right? And it's because we are so immersed in it na parang we're scared of representing it in literature. Um, and I think many of us uh, felt the same way, um, how to be respectful towards our culture while writing a fiction piece on it. I'd like to point your attention. I, I, I read Bone Talk by Candy Gurley. Candy Gurley is currently based in UK. His, uh, sh but she's a Filipino writer currently based in UK. Um, Bone Talk is about um, a, a boy living in uh, Bon Talk. Uh, and the setting was um, pre-American colonial times. right? And it's imaginative. It's imaginative, but at the same time, it's respective. Uh, it's uh, respectful, sorry. In the sense na me reading it with my perspective as Igorot or growing up here or having studied about the culture, I did not feel na, teka, malito. All right. Malito eh, mali yung representation niya. And I think that's one problem then na parang when we read a work of fiction, about Cordillera, we always base it on dapat tama siya. Okay? Um, I, I think we also need to balance it with the imaginative, right? While at the same time, not, ne not necessarily being super realistic, but respectful. So, yeah. In other words, I have practical advice. Um, take it from me, I have had my share of accusations of self-exoticizing my culture, um, which is, uh, of course, not intentional. Uh, but anyway, practical advice. If you did not experience it, do not write fiction about it. Um, as the agency and uh, uh, the knowledge, there was, uh, yeah, I, I feel strongly about that. If you did not experience it, uh, don't write fiction about it. Yeah. You have, uh, I will agree and disagree to what L.A. said. <laughs> For experience, uh, if Hannah, right? Uh, be authentic. If you've experienced the culture or uh, kung meron yung experience mo, I think there's this piece na experience with a Cordilleran man. Perhaps you're talking that way. Then be authentic kung ano na experience mo with this Cordilleran man or this Cordilleran woman. Say it. 
sa Cordilleras, I also encourage you, to, I challenge you na not only just representation, but if you want to use this literature to challenge a certain aspect of the Cordilleran culture, why not do it para sa mga Cordillerans or, so in, or those who are in the community? If you do have not experienced it, you can still write about it. How I think most writers are good listeners or should be good listeners. That's my opinion. You should be good listeners, my empathy or ano pa yung iba? empathy or sympathy. And of course, a good amount of research with what you are writing. Hmm. Uh, I think we're out of time or one one last is there one is there one last question? Si yung kay Ma'am Rachel po, uh, two points lang po na gusto kong sabihin. Doon po sa fear na sinasabi nyo about writing, um, sa about the Cordillan culture, number one po kasi, um, sa tingin ko po, yung modernization po ngayon na since before po, uh, yung nakafocus po sila sa paganism and now we have encountered a lot of different religions, isa pong factor yun na um, hindi po na-empower at saka natatakot po yung um, the younger generations now to talk about it because they don't know about it. They haven't experienced it. And secondly po, um, wala pong integration ng culture sa education natin na hindi, we focus more on the academic side po instead of our, without even uh, recognizing the culture of the place where you are studying. Mm -hmm. lang po. Uh, yeah, thank you for that comment. I agree. And I think I uh, Okay, if it's a question, one l question. Uh, while we're passing the mic, uh, mic. I'm so sorry uh, we don't have enough time, but if you do have questions, maybe we can stay here and you can approach us later. Sorry, time is short. Okay, sige po. <laughs> Good morning po. Uh, yung question ko po kay, uh, is para po kay Ma'am Domay. Um, uh, ano po yung mga mapapayo nyo po, lalo na po sa aming generation, Generation Z na mga estudyante na may talent sa pagsusulat or aspiring writers? Ano po yung mapapayo nyo sa amin? Since sabi nyo nga po, yung dream nyo is magkaroon ng communities na yung passion nila is writing here in Cordillera Literature. Ano po yung mapapayo nyo? I think I'll take off from what Abby said na um, we should know how to listen. Ang dami, we, we have a lot of stimulus today, especially our generation, Gen Z, millennials. Ang dami sa just in our hands. And it's important to go back to the most primal uh, form of language which is listening um, and also um, parallel to listening is reading. Yun. So if you want to write more, you read more. If you want to, um, uh, ano ba? if you want to connect, if you want to collaborate, if you want to build a community, very important yung listening because um, that's basic connection. Thank you. Uh, so I think that's all the time we have. Uh, we have. So uh, just as a final thought, um, I wanted to uh, add, a, add a quotation. I said before I was interested in science fiction, and one of the reasons is because in some ways imagining a future is imagining a story. I think there's an increasing number of people who are saying that um, one of the tasks of a writer is even to try to imagine in concrete terms a world that is different than the one we have, right? So, and it's the, it's the link in some way between uh, the, the realism of trying to engage with what's around you and trying to say something new, say something different, like, uh, where will we go to? Um, so the quotation that, uh, one of the quotations that inspired uh, the idea for this talk is from uh, the American writer 
Adrienne Marie Brown, and she said, we are living now inside the imagination of people who thought economic disparity and environmental destruction were acceptable costs for their power. I often feel I am trapped inside someone else's imagination, and I must engage my own imagination to break free. I think in a lot of ways, actually, a lot of what has been said is, yes, there are, and I'll, I'll speak to what you said as well, that yes, maybe you don't have uh, this sense of uh, belonging in that way, but as LA said, you have experiences that are your own that are still from living in Baguio and writing in Baguio. And so you have, you have this capacity for imagining, uh, imagining a world that is recentered at least around your experiences. And if each of us do that collectively, like together we imagine uh, stories for the future that are centered differently than the world we have now, then I think probably they add up to something together rather than uh, trying to be paralyzed. Maybe, maybe the idea that we're each empowered in that way to do it is, is one way to get over into the, <laughs> into the form of being prolific that uh, LA is dreaming about, and which I'm dreaming about, and maybe we all are. So thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope, uh, I hope it's been an interesting uh, conversation. Thank you to all of the members of the panel for being here as well. Yeah. So thank you, Alan, for those words, for being our discussant today, and of course, to all our panelists. But before we end today's session, may I please call on our dean, Sir Jimmy Fong, to help in the awarding of certificates. Sir, so, so So the Certificate of Appreciation is presented to Alan Carino for being our discussant today, to Mr. Ivan Labaini for being a resource person, Ms. Florenda Pedro or Dumay Solingay as a resource person, Ms. L.A. Piludin as a resource person, Mr. Abby Wagen as a resource person, and to Miss Rachel Bitlongay <laughs> as a resource person. Thank you, everybody. And of course, our goodie bags for our. Yes. <laughs> Do I get one too? Oh, oh to, fo to follow, okay. So before we end, may I just please invite you, please, as Professor Pitlong, I uh, invited you earlier to join the Buklatan over at the Museo Cordillera. And there is also an announcement that I was given here for those who are interested in, okay, let me find it, here you go. For those who are interested in a sports journalism workshop with Kinito Henson, this one will be on Saturday, November 24, 2018, 9.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. here at the Teatro Amianan. So in case you are interested, uh, get in touch with uh, the coordinators. And of course, again, I'd like to remind everybody that the viewing for the Tanabata's Wife will be held on Sunday. There will be five screenings. They start at 9, and the last one will be at 7. Prof, do we have any other thing that we'd like to remind? Oh, so we'd like to acknowledge also the presence of our former Dean, Mam Beth Kalinawagan, and of course the presence of our CAC Dean, Sir Jimmy Fong. Thank you everyone for coming. May I please uh, direct you outside if you are interested in some coffee and... Uh, yes? Uh, yes, but in return, before you can have your coffee, may I please have your evaluation forms. Very, very important. Yes, I'll collect them outside. Thank you. Um, guys, my lunch is uh, down. So, time na tayo. Yay! Thank you.